So the last case we're going to do is Schneider v. Phelps. Um, and, and Schneider v. Phelps is a, uh, it's a humdinger of a case. And there's, there's some background that I, I'll talk about in terms of the case. And I'll talk about background um, as well involving um, the group uh, itself in question. So um, this case involves a group known as the Westboro Baptist Church. The Westboro Baptist Church is identified as a church, but it would be more better understand, understood as a family um, because really the only members of the church are members of the Phelps um, family. Uh, and they have made it a, as part of their um, church mission to uh, draw attention to themselves and, and protest things um, in a very offensive fashion. Um, and they do this for a very particular purpose, which I will get to. So in this particular case, um, members of the Westboro Baptist Church were protesting uh, outside of the funeral uh, of, an, of a man who was killed um, in service uh, of his country. And so in, in Maryland, so they, they show up to Maryland and they hold flags within sight um, of the funeral. Um, the flag, the, the, uh, the banners that they're holding up um, include thank God for dead soldiers, um, fag troops. Uh, this is an organization that location of their, of their website um, is God hates fags. This is a organization that exists to be provocative. Now the background that's not about this case. They do that for a reason. And the reason is they're not stupid. And when they go to places like college campuses or um funerals or what have you, and they have these flyers and banners and say these things and be outrageous. They absolutely know that there's a very high likelihood that city officials um, are going to stop their speech because it is patently offensive. And what they do is they turn around and sue these colleges and these cities and these states for abridging their First Amendment rights. And they win and they win damages. And that is pretty much the only way that this family can continue to fund itself is from the monetary damages that they win against these locations and these localities um, for saying this outrageous stuff. There is a large reason to believe that this family at this point doesn't believe um, what they're articulating. They're just finding new and interesting, outrageously stupid ways uh, to offend people so that they can continue these First Amendment-based lawsuits um, to continue funding their continued existence. At this point, um, th the family is basically all attorneys. They've all, the majority of them have gone to law school. And this is what they engage in. So this case is just um, another example of them doing this because after this case, they did go on and sue Maryland for abridging their speech um, and did once win some civil damage in this case. Um, and so that, that's who these people are. Um, so the state of Maryland and, and the city um, uh, didn't do anything in this case, but the individuals, um, the members of the family, uh, sued for damages of emotional distress. So a civil claim, um, not a, a, a civil rights claim, but a civil claim between two individuals. So the issue in this case is, um, does the First Amendment protect protesters um, from liability of intentionally afflicting uh, emotional distress? So are they protected from any form of civil liability that stems from their speech, um, in this case, at a funeral? Uh, and the answer to that uh, for the Supreme Court is a resounding 
eight to one vote that crosses ideology that says, yes, this group is not civilly liable for uh, inflicting any sort of emotional distress on, uh, on the family. And the reasoning for that um, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, John Roberts writes the majority opinion, and he says that, that, that of course, the First Amendment bars um, individuals from being civilly liable for emotional distress because a civil damage being awarded is a damage awarded by a court. And thus, the court is the one ordering the damage, and the court ordering a damage against a group for speaking is clearly a violation of the First Amendment. Um, that though the, it, they, their speech wasn't punished by a government entity directly while it was happening, if damages are allowed after the fact to be awarded because of these damages, that is the government in essence sanctioning and agreeing um, with the judgment of the content of their speech. The majority goes on to be very clear that there's no question that the speech itself is political. It's absolutely offensive. No, no question there. But it is also clearly political. This isn't in the nonsense realm of bong hits for Jesus. Um, but God hates dead soldiers. Um, it's very clearly a political message. And because of its political nature, it does have special protection under the First Amendment. Um, so despite the fact that it is morally reprehensible, um, it is precisely those more that that political nature of the speech, that moral, uh, that moral reprehensiveness that must be protected. Um, the majority, Justice John, Justice Roberts, um, refuses to go into um, expanding upon what is known as the uh, captured uh, audience doctrine. Um, so there was an argument made by um, the the plaintiffs in this case is that that they couldn't leave that they they were at a funeral they were there to pay their respects and they were in essence a captive audience they could not get away from the speech they could not stop listening to the speech um and, and therefore there is an exception known as the captain's audience doctrine um which basically would could have applied in this case but the argument being made that they were a captured audience simply does not the, the court refuses to weigh in on it. Um, there's one dissent, and it's Justice Alito. Um, so there's a conservative dissent in this case, lone dissenting justice. Um, and he says that our profound national commitment to free and open debate is not a license uh, for vicious verbal assault, the type of which occurred in this case. Um, he simply says that you can state a political message, you can make a political message, you can have political speech, you don't have to be so patently offensive about it. Um, and, and it's not that he's, he's, he's calling for us to be um, better, um, more uh, nice society. He's just saying like the Constitution doesn't exist to protect just offensiveness because there's absolutely a way that the Phelpses could have communicated this message without being offensive. There isn't a question of, uh, of the message itself that they were communicating. It doesn't deserve protection. Absolutely it does. But the method by which they communicated it for Alito does not deserve um, protection. And he would, uh, he would be okay with fuck the draft because fuck the draft, what's offensive in fuck, in fuck the draft in Cohen v. California is simply the word fuck. It's a word. The word itself might be offensive. But that's miles different than God hates dead soul or God loves dead soldiers. It's it's there's there's miles of difference in terms of the offensiveness to that. And for Justice Alito, the, the particulars in this case are simply too far. Um, and he would refuse to use the First Amendment to protect this type of speech in this case.